Hello, and welcome to episode 8 of Sex Ed. That's S-E-C-T-S Ed. I'm Patrick Reynolds. And I'm Michael Albany. And before we dive into today's subject, uh, is there a certain cult, heresy, or new religious movement you want us to cover on our podcast? If so, you can always contact us by email at sexed at gmail.com or through our website, www.sexed.com. Not only do we value your feedback, but we also value hearing about what sex interests you and what sorts of faiths you want to learn more about in future episodes. In this episode, though, we've got a lot of ground to cover because we're dealing with the Church of All Worlds. Founded in the 1960s by a group of science fiction fanatics, this movement took its name and several of its core tenets from Robert Heinlein's 1961 novel, Stranger in a Strange Land. It also has the distinction of being the first federally recognized pagan church in the United States. So before we can start talking about the Church of All Worlds itself, I think it'll be helpful to first speak more broadly about the concepts of paganism and neo-paganism. So uh, maybe Patrick, if you'd like to begin with that. So the term pagan itself is a word that modern neo-pagans are sort of trying to reclaim in a sense that it was originally derogatory. The Latin word that it's derived from is an insult. It meant someone from the countryside with connotations of someone being traditional and uneducated uh, and someone who wasn't up to date with the new Christian religion that the Roman Empire was in the process of converting to. So basically it has Constantinian roots. Once Constantine yeah, adopts was... Christianity as the major religion of Rome, then anyone who maybe still... Uh, maybe still has faith in the old Roman gods, which have their, which have their basis in the Greek gods, those are pagans. Well, yes, but it's also a very broad umbrella term because the old Roman religion and all the various religions of all the many people they conquered and also a lot of people they didn't conquer all got lumped into the term pagan. And all those uh, older religions were themselves constantly in flux. Uh, and by the time Christianity was really starting to become a major religion, there were dozens, if not hundreds, of other new religions that were emerging within or on the edges of the Roman Empire. And the believers in all those newer religions ended up ultimately getting lumped in with the pagan label as well. So what makes paganism really hard to talk about is that it ultimately ends up meaning just not Christian, at least colloquially. So being this huge catch-all category... None of the many faiths who neo-pagans model themselves after would ever have called themselves pagan or even necessarily identified very strongly with each other. And so pagan, at its core, it's an oppositional word. It's defining people by what they are not. That's one of the very few things that ancient pagans and modern neo-pagans actually do have in common, is that they're both really defined by not being Christian. Although it's definitely expanded at this point, it's not being an Abrahamic religion because Islam and Judaism are, are definitely not pagan either. Are there any sort of overarching uh, sort of belief systems, belief structures, common themes that run through groups that associate themselves with that term pagan, though, that you would, uh, that you would identify? Yeah, so a lot of the things that are really foundational, at least to some major branches of modern neo-paganism, are... Um, a lot of ideals that are rooted in the 1960s counterculture in America. There is a lot of environmentalism and a lot of feminism and also a lot of really strong rejections of what were seen in the 1960s as traditional American values and belief systems. So there's a lot of inverting things, flipping things from 1960s American versions of Christianity and quite a lot of politics as well. There's a lot of overlap from this aspect of it that could definitely be considered New Age religion as well. You sometimes even hear those terms neo-pagan and New Age interchangeably, um, since both do to some extent rely on the writings of people like uh, Gerald Gardner and Margaret Murray, who should not be considered as reliable historical sources, although um, their sort of pseudo-history helped form a sort of mythical explanation of pagan history or neo-pagan history as they needed a stronger sense of connection in some ways to these ancient symbols that were being repurposed for modern uh, ideologies, uh, especially if you're going with Wicca or things like that, earth religions. It's, it's a whole sort of section of neo-paganism, although there are other branches and definitely outliers on it. every single neo-pagan sect, you know, as I've stated before, very diverse group, lots of different beliefs. Um, but rejection of, of Christian or what was seen as traditional Christian principles is a very strong 
aspects of a lot of the neo-pagan movements and definitely in the church of all worlds statements i'm making can definitely be argued this is just why i'm trying to uh be very vague about it because there's quite a lot of room for interpretation and quite a lot of room for arguing about really fragmentary bits of historical information that people are making assumptions off of and people who care about it uh can argue forever if we have to <laughs> uh about some of these definitions but yeah in general terms uh for the purposes of this episode the things that we need to think about in terms of neo-paganism are the 1960s uh, counterculture elements of it because they're very big in the church of all worlds um and just as a i don't want to start too many arguments but as a side note i suppose um some of the really foundational you know pillars of the ancient pagan beliefs that some of these groups are trying to reconstruct are the exact opposite of what you might expect from uh from the counterculture or the hippie movement um some of the the traditional roman paganism or greek paganism was all about enforcing loyalty to the state and also uh, really heavily hinged on really violent bloody animal sacrifices um if you know anything about the ideals of of the counterculture movement in the hippies in the 60s uh, a strong loyalty to the state and violence to animals are things that are not central uh to the ideology of most hippies one of those sort of rejection of christianity elements is sort of a rejection of uh sort of um monogamous relationships uh mm -hmm. so you see sort of uh polyamorous relationships emerging and that's something that um i wasn't able to get to a consensus with here but i think it's definitely a thing uh because robert heinlein himself he actually had an open marriage with his second wife so it would make sense that this group that is sort of based on heinlein's work might think of that as something worthy uh to emulate one of the people who uh, po potentially coined the word polyamory was actually a, a priestess of Church of All Worlds, who we're, we're going to meet later. Yeah, um, there is, there's definitely, um, what's the right, I don't know if ecumenical is the right word for it. Um, but yeah, sort of, a, ecumenical is just all Christian churches. What's a, I mean, I guess pantheistic, but there's, there was the aspect of all of these ancient religions that they're harkening back to of they didn't really care at all which gods their neighbors worshipped. They Everything was equally valid uh, in a lot of these, especially the Roman worldview. Uh, they were really known, even going back to you know the Hittites, there was this really common thread of uh, if you invaded or got invaded, the gods would just sort of get absorbed and you'd stick with what you were worshipping and you'd just identify it with something else and you'd combine gods and... Um, just sort of accept uh, all this vast pantheon uh, that you worshipped and also everyone else's, which is something that is uh, pretty common in, in modern paganism that they did actually uh, do actually resemble uh, old school uh, traditional paganism of you can worship whatever, it doesn't matter uh, to me that they're all equally valid. And a lot of these uh, religions then, they a lot of these groups which associate themselves with paganism sort of hearkening back to that sort of pre-christian understanding they're emerging in the 20th century within the context of the 1960s so um that's really where our story begins the story of the church of all worlds which uh truly begins with a group of friends at westminster college in fulton missouri and chief amongst them are richard lance christie and tim zell so Christie and Zell were avid readers of science fiction novels, especially those of author Ayn Rand. Now, Rand has come to be considered something of an icon in American conservatism, thanks to novels like The Fountainhead and especially Atlas Shrugged, uh, that offer narrative explorations of what she called her objectivist philosophy. Um, it's important to note, though, that readers like Christie and Zell, they weren't simply interested in Rand because of her political leanings. Uh, rather, Rand's works frequently featured characters with extraordinary scholastic talent who successfully overcame the oppression of the society around them. Uh, in one novella, for example, one called Anthem, protagonist Equality72521 escapes from his uh, government-assigned job as a street sweeper to pursue his dream of becoming a great scholar, and he eventually becomes the father of a new world with a beautiful wife who wants nothing more than to bear his children. 
But storylines like these, many young men, uh, many young men who may have considered themselves nerds, in fact, uh, they were drawn to Rand's books. These were sources of escapism. Uh, and Christie and Zell, they read them alongside works of, psycho of psychologist Abraham Maslow. Now, even if you've never heard of Maslow, you've likely, you're likely familiar with his hierarchy of needs, the theory that humans are motivated by an ascending order of necessities, beginning with the needs for food, water, air, and going up from there. The highest point of Maslow's hierarchy is called self-actualization, and this is where a level, and this is a level where humans could be the best versions of themselves only after not only meeting, but mastering all their previous needs. So Christie in particular was enthralled with the concept of self-actualization to the point where he began to dream of a world of, quote, Ayn Rand heroes alias Maslonian self-actualizers. As Christie, Zell, and their friends were engaging in spirited discussions about self-actualization, Stranger in a Strange Land hit the store shelves. The novel follows Valentine Michael Smith, a human raised on Mars who returns to Earth and eventually founds his own religion, which we'll soon cover in greater depth. Smith, however, arrives knowing nothing about Earth's customs, and while he's learning about them, their reader, in turn, learns about some of the customs of Mars. One of the most important is that of the grok. One of the most important is that of the grok. The word grok that Heinlein invented essentially means to understand intuitively or by empathy. To grok something, then, is to comprehend it completely. Christie, Zell, and their friends quickly added grok to their lexicons and thought about ways to grok each other. In 1962, they came up with the solution of founding a group called Apple. They took the name from an Aztec word for water, which fit into many aquatic elements that they adopted directly from Stranger in a Strange Land. Early in the novel, for example, Smith's nurse at the hospital he's being held in shares a glass of water with him, inadvertently binding the two as water brothers. Thus, members of Adle took part in a water-sharing ceremony in order to form empathetic bonds with each other. Outside this water-sharing ceremony, though, uh, Adel exhibited few signs of being a formal religion. When questioned about the religiosity of Adel, Christie replied, quote, Adel is not a unitary movement with a rigid dogma and a narrow specific cause. It is a vast, heterogeneous assemblage of ornery, cantankerous, intelligent, independent, unacculturated human beings who have an identified who have an identifiable something that sets them apart and binds them together. Expecting all Atlans to agree at any given time on anything is a classic example of wide-eyed optimism, end quote. Thus, Adel was, at its core, a group of intellectually diverse friends with a common goal of one day achieving self-actualization. They formed a reading group to discuss the latest science fiction and psychology, uh, including the works of LSD advocate Timothy Leary. They printed their own journal and student newspaper, and they even planned to open a nudist colony. However, Addo always remained small in size, likely because its members never tried to proselytize. Most Atlans, after all, consider themselves outsiders who valued being part of an intimate group that accepted them even with all their eccentricities. So in that way, I think we can think of early uh, the, this progenitor of the Church of All Worlds a lot in the same ways as the early... Uh, early Heaven's Gate, uh, base, and probably lots of other UFO religions. Basically, you have a group which is not so much interested in bringing the whole world into its way of thinking, but uh, values its sort of privacy and just having a group of like-minded people who you can kind of hang out and be friends with and who accept you for who you are. Although these, uh, this group so far, I mean, I, I don't know how this is going to turn out. Yeah. So far, this group does seem uh, a lot more fun than Heaven's Gate. <laughs> Uh, it, it seems like they're more into the, the spirit of the 60s than, than Heaven's Gate uh, members were. Yeah, that's definitely a sort of recurring theme is the sort of spirit of the 60s, and we'll definitely get... Which is, yeah, it gets into the, the sort of overlap between New Age and Pagan, um, is that, yeah, if you decide you believe in this one day, and then next week you find something that works better, there's an experimental aspect to it. Uh, a lot of the time, especially once you get into to chaos magic, but that's uh, another episode. Nevertheless, some Atlans, particularly Zell, were ambitious. Zell even said his ultimate goal was full and controlled use of all powers of ESP, that is extrasensory perception, and PK, that is psychokinesis, for the entire human race. It should come as little surprise then that Zell would take up the task of founding a religion. 
He did this in 1968 by formally chartering in the state of Missouri the Church of All Worlds. The name for this faith came directly from A Stranger in a Strange Land, as the Church of All Worlds was also the name of Smith's religious denomination. Highland crafted the Church of All Worlds as a synthesis of many traditional religions that can be seen in church members throughout his book. Smith begins his religious journey by earning a divinity degree from a Protestant school before converting to his faith a Muslim man named Mahmud, the second human to learn the Martian language. Among Smith's inner circle, there are several Jewish women, along with the writer Jubal Hershaw, a self-proclaimed agnostic. So while members of Heinlein's Church of All Worlds followed Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and agnosticism, there were also elements of Eastern religions. One of the phrases Smith repeats throughout the book is, Thou art God, which is incredibly similar to the Sanskrit phrase, Tatavamasai, Thou art that, important to many schools of Hinduism. The novel's Church of All Worlds also takes inspiration from another fictional religion called, called the Fosterite Church of the New Revelation. Some scholars have interpreted the Fosterites as parodies of Scientologists, since Heinlein supposedly had a conversation with L. Ron Hubbard sometime around 1945, in which he mentions how a church could engage in a wide variety of activities free from regulatory interference because of the protection given in the U.S. to churches and religions. This was about five years before Hubbard released Dianetics, The Modern Science of Mental Health, as a foundational text of Scientology. Still, the Church of the New Revelation could have just as easily been meant to represent a modern Christian megachurch. In addition to its name, the Church of All Worlds that Zell founded utilized several key concepts from Stranger in a Strange Land. Communities of followers, for example, were called nests. Phrases such as grok and thou art God also became instrumental as they coalesced with Zell's beliefs about self-actualization. According to Zell, quote, divinity is the highest level of aware consciousness accessible to each living being, manifesting itself in the self-actualization of that being. Thus, we can truly say, all that grox is God, end quote. So from this quotation alone, it's clear that the Church of All Worlds embraced Heinlein while rapidly moving away uh, from its Ayn Randian roots. It was, first and foremost, a religion. While Rand was not only staunchly atheistic, but anti-theistic, in the sense that not only did she not believe in a god, but believed that anyone who followed a religion was uh, putting an impediment to their own sort of success. The Church of All Worlds also proposed a path that was more accepting than Rand's. Only an exceptional few could hope to become heroes in the vein of Atlas Shrugs' John Galt, while self-actualization was accessible to anyone willing to work towards it. Furthermore, while Rand stressed fervent individualism in her works, the Church of All Worlds, with its nests, celebrated collaboration and cooperation. Finally, the Church of All Worlds departed from Rand's example in its concern for the environment. On multiple occasions throughout her life, Rand made it clear she was the farthest thing from an environmentalist. She coldly stated in one interview, people who are hurt by smog should just move. The United States is a large and free country. No one can order a person to live in Los Angeles or New York City. If some place is bad for your health, you shouldn't live there. Nonetheless, the 1960s saw the rise of a vocal environmental movement that attracted many pagans and neo-pagans who hoped to become attuned with the natural world. The Church of All Worlds also expressed ecological concerns, especially after September 6, 1970. That day, Zell claimed to have experienced a vision in which he saw the Earth as a single living organism that he called Terabia and later renamed, and later renamed Gaia. This goddess, for lack of a better term, was connected with every living creature, which acted almost like a central nervous system. Thus, when humanity reached its true potential, it would form a telepathic union with the goddess and allow it to awaken. This theogenesis became the defining original belief of the Church of All Worlds, and also uh, sounds like uh, Avatar, the, the, the blue people. Zell shared his visions through the Church's magazine, Green Egg. Established alongside the Church of All Worlds, Green Egg was a pivotal publication that acted as an early forum for discussions of neo-pagan practices, and that catapulted the Church of All Worlds to the forefront of the neo-pagan world. It was through Green Egg that Zell also became acquainted with a goddess-worshipping community called Ferafria and became inspired to incorporate other elements of ritual and mysticism into his science fiction-inspired religion. This alienated many members of Adel, uh, which operated as an independent group, but Zell's oldest friend Christy remained a stalwart go-between, even contributing environmental articles to Green Egg. As Atlans started departing Missouri, though, Zell strengthened his partnership with Ferafria, and together they formed the Council of Themis, 
a neo-pagan ecumenical alliance working for the realization of the eco-physical potential of all human beings. Zell and his partner Morning Glory took to the road to promote the Church of All Worlds. Although the church didn't so much proselytize per se, Zell was incredibly interested in spreading awareness of it. He and Morning Glory did this by entering a number of costume contests at science fiction conventions, drawing crowds' attention with their pet snake, not unlike another character from Stranger in a Strange Land. These convention appearances proved to be controversial among Church of All Worlds members. However, no one could deny that Zell was a first-rate showman, even though he would not always use his showmanship for the church. In 1979, Zell had another vision and changed his name to Otter Gazelle, uh, that's G apostrophe Z E L L, before moving to California with Morning Glory. This was only a few years after the collapse of Green Egg, which, despite its prominent position in the neo pagan community, suffered greatly under a hands off editorial approach. What began as an inviting space for the safe discussion of theology and worship augmented by environmental writings collapsed into a cacophonous, unfocused magazine that began accepting letters from neo-Nazis. It ceased publication in 1976 to the relief of many American pagans. Now, while this has nothing to do with the Church of All Worlds, uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't pause for a moment to talk about one of the activities Gazelle engaged in during his hiatus from church leadership, breeding unicorns. And you heard that right, breeding unicorns. In the late 1970s, Gazelle and Morning, Morning Glory came across the work of biologist W. Franklin Dove, who observed that after surgically binding the horns of a developing goat together, the horns would merge into a single one uh, resembling a unicorn's horn. Gazelle and Morning Glory brought their creations to Renaissance fairs across the country until Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey approached them and offered them a six-figure sum for four of these unicorns of their own. And this amount also bought their silence, since the circus wanted to tell people basically that these creatures just showed up one day at one of their tents in Texas. Uh, they claimed to have only had one, but they uh, essentially kept three of them in reserve and showed it off. We'll also be including a picture of uh, this so-called unicorn uh, in the blog post that's going to accompany this episode. Um, and you can judge for yourself whether you buy it as a unicorn at first sight. Without Gazelle, however, the Church of All Worlds began to fall into a state of disrepair. In the early 1980s, membership was really languishing until around 1985, when Gazelle and Morning Glory finally returned. Along with them, a church priestess named Adonia Judith arose, and together the three organized an ambitious recruitment campaign. By 1974, the Church of All Worlds had claimed to have nests across the United States, from New York to California. The 1980s, though, witnessed the church going international, with new nests established in Europe, Africa, Asia, and Australia. Green Egg also reemerged in 1988 under newly focused editorial control. Things were looking up for the Church of All Worlds, which also incorporated several subsidiaries that Gazelle and Morning Glory had founded. Ecosophical Research Association, or ERA, for example, which was dedicated to cryptozoological research. Shortly before returning to the Church of All Worlds, Gazelle and Morning Glory organized an ERA trip to New Guinea to search for mermaids, but were only able to find some dugongs. The pair also collaborated with neo-pagan networker Gwendian Penderwin to create the Holy Order of Mother Earth, or HOME, a monastic sanctuary in California dedicated to the practice of magic and pagan rituals. This grace period, however, was short-lived. Near the end of the 20th century, a power struggle erupted among the leaders of the Church of All Worlds, and in 1996, Otter Gazelle, who was now going by the name Oberon Zell Ravenheart, which is the name he currently goes under, uh, was removed from his position as publisher of Green Egg. By 2001, the magazine folded again, and Zell Ravenheart was excommunicated from the Church of All Worlds that had decided to move its governing body from Missouri to Ohio. During the second hiatus, Zell Ravenheart uh, proved that he continued to be inspired by contemporary literature. Uh, by establishing the Grey School of Wizardry, no doubt inspired by the Harry Potter books that were uh, coming out at the time. And this was an online magic school that, at the time of this recording, it's still operational and it has over 20 professors listed on its webpage. We'll provide a link to that uh, in our show notes. By 2004, most of the Ohio clergy members who ousted Zell Ravenheart had themselves resigned, allowing Zell Ravenheart to reestablish the Church of All Worlds in California for what he called its third Phoenix rebirth. It remains an established religion to this day with its own website that we'll be sure to link in the show notes. When you click the link, the site invites you to enter and drink deep, hearkening back to the aquatic motifs it adopted from Stranger in a Strange Land. 
However, after spending just a few minutes there, you'll realize it has evolved significantly since 1968. It's now, for example, a steward of Amphwen, a pagan commune Gwendolyn Penderwen established that currently hosts festivals around the cycles of the moon. Green Egg also emerged in 2007 as a digital publication and podcast, but its current editorial staff, drawn from Appalachia, brings with it an understanding and greater desire to discuss granny magic. At first, it seems like a major departure from the original Church of All Worlds, but Zell Ravenheart is quoted as saying, as early as 1970, that all religions are true, as indeed are all sincerely held opinions, in the sense that personal reality is necessarily subjective. In other words, what you believe to be true is true by definition. A voodoo death curse is as real to its victims and as effective as being saved is to a Christian fundamentalist or the kosher laws are to an Orthodox Jew. A flat earth with stars and planets revolving around it was as real to the medieval mind as our present globe and solar systems are to us. Hysteric paralysis and blindness are as real to the sufferer as their organic, counterpoint, as their organic counterparts. The snakes and bugs of alcoholic and narcotic deliria are real to the addict, and so is the fearful world of the paranoiac. From the standpoint of human consciousness, there is no other reality than that which we experience, and whatever we experience is therefore reality, therefore true. Thus it can be said that there is and is not a true doctrine of the Church of All Worlds, since all truth is in the mind of the believer. And with that, we come to the end of Episode 8. We hope you enjoyed it, and we hope you'll consider joining us next time by subscribing to us on iTunes or YouTube. To keep informed with our podcast's latest happenings, be sure to also follow us on Facebook and Twitter, both at SexEd. And if you really like the show, help it grow. Tell a friend or family member about Sex Ed today. This episode of Sex Ed was researched, written, produced, and presented by Michael Albaney and Patrick Reynolds, and was edited by Patrick Reynolds. Sex Ed is created under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. It was recorded at LEADER, the Lab for the Education and Advancement in Digital Research at Michigan State University. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent those of Michigan State University or any of its affiliates.